Welcome everyone to Sydney Science Trail. My name is Sam Abraham and I am from CSIRO, part of the Generation STEM team. Uh, the amazing scientists talk about citizen science. Uh, but before we begin, I would like to start by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, who are the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. And I would also like to acknowledge the First Nations people of Australia with the first scientists and engineers with contribution to land management, farming and astronomy. Welcome again to Sydney Science Trail Talking Science event and happy National Science Week. Sydney Science Trail is a partner of the Australian Museum and the Botanic Gardens of Sydney and this National Science Week project is supported by the Australian Government, University of Technology Sydney and the University of New England. Today's session is on citizen science and we will be hearing from three leading experts about some really inspiring and important work that they're doing in their fields. Uh, but I would like to start with uh, introducing you to Dr. Jodie Rowley, who works at the Australian Museum and at the University of New South Wales as the curator of amphibian and reptile conservation biology. Jodie is a biologist who focuses on Australasian amphibian diversity, ecology and conservation, and has led over 25 expeditions in the southeastern region of Asia, co-discovering more than two dozen new frog species. Jody will be speaking about the Frog ID Citizen Science Project. Over to you. Thank you. So I'm obsessed with frogs. Uh, it was 18 when I first really saw frogs, came across them in a rainforest stream at night and fell in love with them. And I only got into citizen science because I love frogs. Uh, and so I want to talk to you about the Frog ID project. Uh, that is a national citizen science project where essentially frogs are in so much trouble that we need everybody to help us figure out how they're doing and what we need to do to save them. And you can take part. Can I get a raise of hands? Who has heard of Frog ID before? A couple, okay, all right. Well, this is very important talk. Uh, so. We have a remarkable 247 species of native frog in Australia that we know of. And I say that we know of because we're actually still discovering species new to science on a regular basis. So the frogs with little circles around them, little yellow circles in the picture, have been described in the last few years, including uh, the screaming tree frog from the Sydney area, which if you've heard the screaming tree frog, you would know why it was called the screaming tree frog. And that's one frog I won't impersonate. Uh, so, unfortunately though, we have a really bad track record with frogs. At least four species have been lost to extinction, including the gastric brooding frog, which you can see in the little, it's actually in a jar at the Australian Museum, the top picture. So there was two species of amazing gastric brooding frog in rainforest in Queensland. They had this really cool reproductive uh, mode where they would fertilise their eggs externally and then the, one of the frogs would gobble them up uh, into their belly and the eggs had a special hormone coating the eggs which would then turn off their stomach acid so they wouldn't eat their eggs and there safe in their belly they would develop into little tiny frogs protected from predators open their mouth and their little babies would hop out which was amazing but unfortunately in the early 1980s uh, these frogs uh, became extinct they haven't been seen since and we think maybe up to seven of Australia's frog species are extinct but we're still looking for looking for all of them actually just in case. Uh, and we've got 43 species threatened with extinction. So they're not, things are not going well. Um, um, one of the biggest obstacles we face is, is that we don't know that much about frogs. But why should we care? Like, if a frog disappears in a forest, is it going to make a difference to us? Well, the actu actually, the answer is yes. So even though each individual frog is tiny, together they make up a huge portion of the biomass. So in many ecosystems, if you made imaginary piles of 
all the frogs, all the reptiles, all the birds. The frog pile would actually be the biggest. And if you've ever been to the outback in a flood, you'll realise like, well, you might not see them for a whole year. Uh, when it actually rains, frogs erupt and they're absolutely everywhere. And they're a really important connector between aquatic and, and terrestrial ecosystems. They're a really important part of the food web. They eat tons of invertebrates, including pest species. Tadpoles eat algae. And they're also eaten by a whole lot of other animals. Um, we might want to be more selfish in our reasons for wanting frogs, and that could be that tadpoles actually do compete with mozzies, so mosquito larvae. Um, and so if you've got a healthy frog community and you're, you're sort of in your area, hopefully you'll get bitten less by mozzies, don't get any of the diseases that mozzies can give you. Uh, and they also produce peptides on their skin. Each species a different kind of set of compounds that we're using for human medicine now. So things like antibiotics, antivirals, um, all sorts of things that we're investigating to use to help us. And they're also really fantastic bioindicators. So by knowing how our frogs are doing in the environment, we have a much better understanding of our environment in general. Uh, and Australia's frogs are being hit hard by lots of different things, habitat loss and modification, introduced species, climate change, and disease is something that is we think is one of the main reasons that a lot of our frogs are suffered, suffering. But, like I said, we've got a lot of amazing frogs in Australia. Australia is a huge country. It's remote. There's not that many frog biologists like myself. So what we need desperately is everybody's help to help us understand frogs, which is where the Frog ID app came in. So Frog ID relies on two things. One, you have an amazing piece of technology in your pocket that can record and it can know the latitude and longitude of where you are and the time and everything. And two is that each frog species has a unique call. So there are 247 unique calls that frogs make in Australia. So uh, there's a competition at the moment for Science Week uh, and the banjo frog is the only frog in the top 10 animal sounds. So I encourage everyone to vote for that. Uh, but it has a call a bit like a banjo. So bonk, bonk. Uh, and then you might have a common eastern froglet woke me up this morning and last night several times calling from my backyard. <laughs> So each species is yelling out what they are and all you have to do is whip out your phone with the Frog ID app, press record for 20 seconds and then submit that to a team at the Australian Museum and either myself or one of my colleagues will listen to every single recording and let you know how many frog species and what frog species you're getting. And together, we're building a massive database of what will be, in a couple of months, one million records of frogs. Now, when I first started Frog ID, I thought I'd be lucky if five of my friends, uh, you know, and my family would use it. But turns out uh, that we've got uh, hundreds of thousands of people have downloaded the app and about 40,000 people have actually submitted audio, which is awesome. And together, we're mapping frogs across Australia uh, and we're figuring out, and it is now the greatest source of frog records in Australia, we're bringing out a whole bunch of things. So we've discovered that, for example, green tree frogs, big iconic Aussie frog that used to be throughout Sydney, has all but disappeared from Sydney and only persists in some pockets of Western Sydney. So in spring, when it warms up, keep your ears peeled as well for um, the green tree frog, which sounds a little like rup, rup, rup. So we definitely want records of that. Frog ID has been really great at getting threatened species records, including tiny little winter breeding frogs that I, it would take me probably an hour to find one in a swamp, but you don't need to. You just press record and you're getting records of these frogs. Uh, so the Sloan's froglet in particular, we're getting tons of great records, which is helping inform their conservation where we can develop the land and where we can't, for example. Uh, we've, I guess, in the sort of almost six years since Frog ID started, we've had droughts, floods, bushfires, and a mass mortality event where frogs were dropping dead at people's door. And all that time, we've had citizen science people like yourself, me, out there recording frogs and being able to understand the impact of these events, which is remarkable. And the data that we got from Frog ID, from people out there recording frogs after the bushfires, was the first actual data, information that anyone had on the impact of these bushfires on any biodiversity. I couldn't get out there and study the frogs, except for the ones in my backyard, um, but everyone was out there that lived around the fire zone recording frogs, and that was a good news story, because it showed that a lot of frogs really persisted, you know, and were calling even a few days after fire, which was awesome. 
Um, and we're detecting invasive species, so we track the cane toad spread as it comes south down in New South Wales and also west across WA. Uh, and we're also using frog ID to help discover new species. So uh, I think about four of the new species of frog that have come out in Australia in the last few years have used frog ID data, and there's about another six that I know of that will be coming out. And we, we're using the information that people just press and record, recording a frog, we're analysing those calls and we're proving that they have a different call. Um, so it's been incredibly useful. So frog ID for me, I was totally into it because of the frogs and we are using the data to help inform frog conservation and land use planning across Australia. Um, but for me, I also hope that it helps you fall in love with frogs. So particularly as it warms up, um, if you can get out there with the Frog ID app, download it, get out there, record frogs, you really, really can make a difference um, and contribute together because only by working together are we going to be able to make a difference and, and make sure that we have frogs croaking in our backyards uh, for future generations. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much. Beautiful. Thank you. I'm sure there have been multiple opportunities where you've heard frog calls either at home or at school and you've been curious as to what it actually is. So keep that in mind and maybe even download that app later today. Um, I also forgot to mention that at the end of um, our panel discussion here today, we will be having a quick Q&A. So as you're listening, try and think of some questions that you would like to ask our scientists. We will be giving out some prizes to some of the best questions that we get at the end as well. But I would now like to introduce you to our second speaker, David Booth, who works at the University of Technology, Sydney, as a professor of marine ecology, School of Life Sciences. David, spent, David has spent almost 20 years monitoring the migration of tropical fish down the East Australian current and has published more than 180 papers about reef fish ecology, climate change, and other anthropogenic impacts on fishes and fisheries in the Caribbean, Hawaii, and the Great Barrier Reef. David is a passionate advocate for citizen science and will be speaking about citizen science projects for focusing on searching for sea dragons. Over to you, David. Thank you very much. So I don't know how many of you will realise that we have dragons in Australia. If you look to the screen, you'll see one. Uh, not a fire-breathing kind, but a, a leafy sea dragon and a weedy sea dragon. How many people have heard of these, first of all, just to get a bit of a... Yeah, um, they're an amazing creature. They are a fish, and the, the animal that you see on the screen there is a male. Now, how do you tell? It's got eggs on its tail. So, like the seahorses that they're related to, they carry the males carry the eggs, which is rather interesting. Uh, they also carry them without a pouch, whereas the seahorses have a pouch. So, getting to know these animals has been uh, one of my passions for the last couple of decades. But we know so very little about them. One of the things that we have also uh, done in the last few years is coined the term the Great Southern Reef. And if you look at that little map, you'll see the orange is the extent of what we call the Great Southern Reef, right around the bottom of Australia, including Sydney. And we've sort of tried to match up with the Great Barrier Reef to get the message out that this whole reef complex right on shore is an amazing resource. And the, and the sea dragons are sort of the iconic sort of uh, calling cards for the Great Southern Reef. So we actually have three species of sea dragon. The one I'll be mainly focusing on is the weedy sea dragon, the top one there. And it occurs in the blue right around the Great Southern Reef. But there's also two others, the leafy sea dragon. I did my first dive on that a couple of months ago in South Australia, and they are amazing. Uh, and then the, the bottom one there is just a recently discovered one in deeper water. It's called the uh, ruby sea dragon. It looks a bit like the weedy, but it's got a longer snout. We know very little about that at the moment. So, um, the other thing with sea dragons, we're very excited when David Atmer was asked what his favourite animal was and he said, oh, it's, it's the weedy sea dragon in his uh, British accent. And so we're very excited to, to see it get global uh, a spotlight. Also, it's been the subject of a number of children's books and there's a couple shown there and even a play, a kid's play shown in Sydney a few years ago. So it really uh, has gathered people's imaginations and ar around Aquaria, around the world, it's sort of almost the number one exhibit ahead of sharks, which is pretty amazing. Yet we know so very little. So like typical nerdly scientists, we publish papers about this animal, but I'd have to say there's a lot we still don't know. So what I'm going to talk about for the rest of this is how citizen science has helped us get more information 
about this incredible animal. So first of all, what happened uh, last year, and do you remember the huge storms that happened last year, earlier in the year? We probably forget them now, but they really were quite severe. Um, we started getting reports from people who walk the beaches, and there's a lot of people that do this, of sea dragon carcasses on shore washed up. And so this happens occasionally, and we checked with the Australian Museum and other places to show that occasionally you get these washed up. But in the month of April, we had nearly 200 of these animals uh, washing up ashore. And my colleagues, uh, Gigi and Summer, who are volunteers in the project, helped record um, all the emails and the things we got based on some uh, radio interviews and things we'd done to alert people. And so we had a little citizen science project happening right there based on people who don't even get in the water necessarily, people who just walk the beach. And so that basically shows that um, we had a lot of these occurring all over Sydney and we're asking ourselves why. We still don't know the answer, but one of the reasons of course is the big storm. Uh, it turns out these uh, weedy sea dragons don't really like surge, the pressure differences kill them. Also they eat a little uh, crustacean or shrimp called the mycid and they were gone for about six months because of the storm. So we know it was storm related which is climate related. So we're continuing to help work with people to monitor these animals washing up. So it's an interesting little snippet of citizen science. Try again. Ah yes. That's, uh, that lady there is nearly 80 years old and she was one of our main spotters. She it turns out she's walked the uh, Narrabeen Beach for the last 37 years and this is by far the biggest thing she's ever seen. So we know from citizens that this is a very unique occurrence. There she is with her dead dragons, kind of sad. Um, another thing we do with citizen science, which has become uh, larger and larger, is using divers. Now, anyone, does anyone here scuba dive by any chance? Ah, yes. And how many people snorkel? just to get an idea. So not many. So thereby hangs a problem. Whereas everyone lives in a house on land and can walk out the backyard or get out of the bush and look at things, very few people it, uh, by proportion get in the water. So we've targeted diving groups around Australia and they love to take beautiful photographs, much better than mine. And so we've targeted those people because we've developed a citizen science project involving close-up photos of sea dragon bodies and it turns out their spots you can see here are like a fingerprint. And so th there's an example. That particular animal was uh, is the same animal and it was recorded over six years. So we know that animal lives at least six years and we know where it went to. So that project sort of spawned a thing called Sea Dragon Search. And if you want to get more information, if you just Google the word Sea Dragon Search, you'll come to this site that's got all sorts of cool materials. But the basic idea of Sea Dragon Search is to have divers get excited about sea dragons, which they are anyway, it turns out, and to upload their pictures onto the website. And through a, a process of machine learning, which some of you may understand, but it's a bit above my pay grade, they're able to match the body patterns, like a fingerprint, and tell the person who puts the uh, photograph up, oh, this is an animal that was found several years ago, or we've never seen it, and you get to name it. Which is pretty cool. And so now we have about three or 4,000 entries, nothing like the frog stuff yet, but we're hoping we get in that direction. And based on this, we've been able to understand that these animals can live not just the eight years we found with previous tagging studies, but up to 13. And that's an animal we call Speedy, he's still alive. Um, and things like distributional range, the little red dots are, are, are where we've found them through the Citizen Science Project. Um, also, um, we have prizes for people who uh, spot them the most and you can see, you might be able to see Andrew Trevor Jones there who works at the museum and Jody would know. He's one of the greatest sea dragon spotters of all time who dives every weekend down at Cornell. So there's certain experts but all sorts of people contribute the data. Um, and as I said, you get to name a sea dragon if it's a new one which could be interesting. Um, and so that whole project really has brought together divers around Australia. Uh, I'm on the international panel, the red list panel for this species and so we're looking to review it again and now we'll have data and what unfortunately it's shown that across Australia we're seeing declines, not everywhere but especially in the southern places like Tasmania, the numbers are just dropping through the floor of these animals. We think climate change, loss of kelp, we don't really know why but the citizen science projects that are going on will inform that in the future. Thank you very much. Our third speaker today is Thomas Masalio, who is a PhD candidate at the University of New South Wales, currently researching Australian plants 
focusing on building better identification tools and more effective survey methods, as well as fire recovery, marine forensics, and invertebrate taxonomy. Thomas will be talking about iNaturalist, the world's largest biodiversity citizen science platform, and explaining how it enables anyone in the world to contribute to real life research and conservation across every species imaginable. Over to you, Thomas. Thanks a lot, Sam. Okay. So say you're out and about, you're on a bushwalk, and you come across this pretty weird looking worm that you've never seen before and you don't recognize. So you take a few photographs and you upload it to iNaturalist and you do a bit of comparisons to other photos and you're pretty sure you figured out that it's a flatworm, uh, but there's thousands and thousands of different flatworms. You're not really sure which specific one it is. You haven't really got great feedback yet. So who do you call? Well, Lee Windsor, of course, and to give a bit of background, Lee Windsor is a researcher at James Cook University uh, in Queensland and he is the number one world expert in terrestrial flatworms. And within one day of you tagging him on iNaturalist, he comes along, he provides an identification for you. Not only that, it turns out this is the first ever record of this species in Australia. And he even compliments you on the excellent photographs that you took. So these kind of interactions occur on a day-to-day -day basis across iNaturalist where Passionate naturalists like yourself are able to interact with any expert from anywhere in the world uh, and benefit from their incredible knowledge and expertise that they've built up over the years to then provide identifications for any animal or any plant or any living organism that you may have recorded anywhere in the world. Uh, so a particular emphasis there that iNaturalist deals with all biodiversity. So it doesn't matter whether you're interested in just frogs or just sea dragons, or whether you're interested in every form of life imaginable, bacteria, fungi, viruses, insects, you name it, iNaturalist covers it. Uh, so it's a very simple principle. All you gotta do is download the app onto your phone, or you can also use it on the computer. You go out, you take a photograph of something, uh, or a sound recording, just like Frog ID. So for example, here's a dragonfly. Uh, that I photographed a few years ago in Western Australia. You upload it to iNaturalist, an expert or often multiple experts come along and provide an identification for you. Uh, and then what I find often to be the most exciting thing is that your records don't just stay in iNaturalist, but they actually flow into all kinds of external databases. So hopefully at least some of you have heard of the Atlas of Living Australia. It's Australia's biggest biodiversity data platform. And basically, it, it doesn't generate really data itself, but it sucks in data from all kinds of other uh, platforms. So Frog ID data goes into the Atlas of Living Australia. Uh, all the Weedy Sea Dragon stuff would be going into the Atlas of Living Australia. And so does iNaturalist data. And once it's in the ALA, it then gets to go into the global version of that, which is the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. And the reason that it's so important that your data are in these databases is that once they are, your records get to be used by real life researchers in research, conservation, land management, all around the world. So you may think you're just photographing a bird or a bug or a plant, but in actuality, those photographs that you're taking become really, really valuable scientific data points. And I could spend a few hours here talking about the thousand and one different ways that iNaturalist data gets used, but I'll just focus on the three main ones. Uh, and before I dive into that to give you a sense of the scale of iNaturalist, just two weeks ago, we went past 150 million records uh, submitted across the world for iNaturalist by almost three million different people. And then if we zoom in just from an Australian perspective, Australia's population is pretty small compared to the rest of the world, but certainly from an iNaturalist perspective, we're really punching above our weight. And you can see we're just about at 6 million records from more than 70,000 people all across the country. So a pretty impressive effort so far. So one of the first major things, and I find probably personally one of the most exciting things, is that at this point, there are literally thousands of new species that have been discovered through iNaturalist. So someone goes out, and it doesn't matter whether you're in the remote Amazonian rainforest or just in your local backyard. Uh, there have been new species discovered in, in both of those places. People have uploaded photographs, 
Experts have seen them, recognised that it's a brand new species, and that have been able to go out, collect specimens, and describe them. So a, a really cool example that I was fortunate enough uh, to be involved with was I live out in Western Sydney. I live in a pretty urban part of Sydney where there really isn't much green space left. But there's a tiny little reserve with a little amount uh, of remnant bushland near my house. And a couple of years ago, I found this weird looking silverfish under a piece of bark that I didn't recognize. Took a few photos, uploaded it to iNaturalist. Within 24 hours, a Austrian entomologist provided a rough identification for me and said he thought it was a pretty exciting find. So I contacted the Australian expert in the group. He said it was brand new, never been seen before. So I went back, collected a few specimens, and now that's been described as a brand new species. And that still remains the only photographs that are in existence of this particular species of insect. And if I had never uploaded the photographs to iNaturalist, it may well have been that this silverfish has, will have remained undiscovered, and it may have remained undiscovered forever. And who knows? It, it's, there are many, many insects nowadays, and other invertebrates in particular, uh, that go extinct without us ever having discovered them or knowing that they existed. Perhaps one of the more common ways that iNaturalist data is used at the moment, though, is for species distribution, so something that both Jody and David mentioned. So figuring out where these species are, um, when they are at these particular places, and also how their ranges are actually changing over time. So that might be in, in response to things like climate change, but also how many species are being introduced around the world by people. Uh, but there are also some species that are just naturally expanding their range. And a really good example of that is the tawny costa. So it's a pretty small species of butterfly. And historically, it was only ever found in Southeast Asia. And then in 2012, a single individual was found in the Northern Territory. And since then, it has been pretty rapidly expanding its range into Australia. And iNaturalist records have actually provided the perfect way to track this butterfly's spread throughout Australia. So if we look at, and if you squint really hard at the little orange dots, if we look at 2016 on iNaturalist, you can see that it was really only found in the Northern Territory, mostly in Kakadu National Park. But if we fast forward just two years to 2018, we can see there's now a big band of records in tropical Queensland, uh, particularly around Townsville and Cairns. By 2020, we've now got records all the way down to the New South Wales border. And in 2022, in fact, we've now got records all the way down to Coffs Harbour. And if we fast forward to the present day and you really squint, you can see there's even a single record there at Alice Springs. So this is absolutely unprecedented data. And in fact, if we look at the next slide, you can see a really stark comparison. So on the left-hand side, we've got all the records that have been submitted to iNaturalist so far just by citizen scientists. And then on the right-hand side, we see all the actual collected butterflies that are currently pinned specimens being held in museums somewhere in Australia. Most of them either the Australian Museum or the Northern Territory Museum. And you can see the incredible difference between the two here. And if we were just relying on museum records, it gives us a really, really incomplete picture of where this butterfly actually is in Australia. So tremendous value here for the citizen science records. Uh, and the final point here is that not only uh, have a species, uh, we can understand their range and we can discover new species, but when you are uploading your individual records to iNaturalist, you have to remember you're uploading photographs. And the photographs themselves contain this hugely rich amount of other information that we can uh, analyze in all kinds of exciting ways nowadays. And one thing that scientists are increasingly looking at uh, is color. So many of you would be familiar with monarch butterflies. There are an introduced species from the US that's pres uh, present pretty much across all of Australia uh, at this point in time. And historically, scientists thought that there may have been two different populations in the US, one on the west coast and one on the east coast. And they thought that one of the populations, the caterpillars were a lot darker. So what the researchers did was they looked at hundreds and hundreds of iNaturalist photos of monarch butterfly caterpillars, and then they analyzed what percentage of the caterpillar was black compared to the yellow and the white. And what they ultimately found was that there was actually no difference between the Western and the Eastern populations. And that really, from and this is really important from a conservation perspective, they're all just one single population that can be managed in the same way. And just to round things out, 
yes, it's really, really fantastic from a data perspective, iNaturalist, but what I find always to be one of the really most satisfying things is that iNaturalist builds up this incredible community where you're passionate about the natural world, you've got many people from all around the world that are passionate about the natural world, so iNaturalist provides the perfect opportunity to bring these people together and make all kinds of amazing friends and new contacts. So I've lost track of the amount of people that I have met and made friends with an iNaturalist. These are just two of them. Uh, Nick on the left from Coffs Harbour, Possum Pete, who has a fantastic username on the right-hand side from down in Victoria. I had never met either of them before. I met them through iNaturalist. Since then, we've been on about 20 trips together uh, all throughout Australia remote Western Australia, Port Macquarie, you name it, we go out and we just spend a week taking thousands and thousands of photos together because we're all as crazy as each other about iNaturalist. So I cannot recommend enough whether it's Frog ID, the Weedy Sea Dragons, iNaturalist, hopefully all three of them. Uh, you go out there, you download these apps and you're not only getting to contribute really, really amazing data that has an actual real world impact, uh, but you can meet some amazing people along the way as well. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Great. I think it's just so incredibly fascinating the really simple and even easy ways that all of us can be involved in citizen science and this is even something that you can go and take home to your families tonight and show them all of the amazing platforms that you've heard about today and even share them with your friends because it doesn't stop here this is something that you can continue to look into both at school and at home, and something that you'll probably carry through with you for the next few years as well. Um, but just wanted to say thank you so much to our speakers again. I know that there's a lot of information bubbling around in our minds, but I'm now going to throw to our audience to see if we have any questions for our scientists today. Yes. Great, so that question was, have you made any discoveries in Fiji? I've never been to Fiji, I would love to. <laughs> uh, not so much discoveries, but we work with a few people there. There's a, a guy called Victor uh, on the Coral Coast who uh, lives in a village and has started a marine protection area. So he and the villagers protect the local reef and so we're there helping him survey. He also restores corals and it was amazing how many fish are in a place where fishing people are not allowed to take the fish and that's a pretty amazing thing in Fiji. So yeah, that's the only. Yeah, personally no, never been to Fiji either, would love to. But certainly there's a lot of iNaturalist records uh, on Fiji, um, a lot of tropical fishes. Um, at one thing I'll point out is that a lot of records on Fiji and iNaturalist are from tourists. So people that maybe they're just visiting for a week, do a bit of snorkeling. So what would be really fantastic, and this applies to really any country in the world, is getting more local people in Fiji really involved as well. So not only will it increase the number of records, but it means we're getting records all the time around the whole year. And they can also contribute their really important local knowledge about these species as well. So yeah, it's, if you're out and about and you're a tourist, it's great to get photos, but it's really fantastic to get the local people involved as well, which I think is a really important way forward for Fiji and similar countries. That's great. Really fascinating question. Thank you. Any other questions from our audience? Yes. Great. So I think this is for Dr. Jody Rowley. What is your favourite frog and why? That's a really tough question and it kind of varies depending on my mood, but possibly Helen's flying frog. Uh, it's a species that my colleagues and I found in Vietnam. It's called a flying frog because it has massive hands and feet and it uses them like parachutes to glide out of the trees. So on everyone's bucket list should be to stand in a pond uh, in Southeast Asia at the beginning of the monsoon season because you just get frogs just flying out of the sky almost and landing in the pond around you. It's amazing. So this, this frog um, was not that far from Ho Chi Minh City, one of the biggest uh, cities in, in Vietnam, but it's, it it's, lives in the trees almost all the time. So I just had to be there at the right time. We found it and we actually named it after my mum. So you can't name frogs after yourself, but you can name them after other people. So my mum's name was Helen, so it's Helen's flying frog. It's a beautiful apple green flying frog from Vietnam. So that's probably my favourite. Beautiful. That's a great story as well and fantastic question. Thank you. 
Any other questions? Yes. How does one not fall in love with frogs? <laughs> How did I? Uh, I wish I had a better story, really, but it was it was kind of love at first sight. So I was cam I didn't grow up camping. I grew up in the city. I never really saw frogs like on TV. I didn't really know that they were in the backyard. They probably weren't. I don't even know. I didn't collect tadpoles. I didn't do any of that kind of stuff. I was really a city kid. But when I started, I did environmental science at UNSW, I started walking um, and camping with people. And we went out at night in a stream and I just saw these frogs. And they were just amazing. Like they were just sitting around the, the stream at night, you know, big eyeballs, toe pads. They just looked, honestly, I thought they looked fake. They looked like they were made out of plastic. They were so beautiful. Um, and then it was so that just silly kind of like, oh my God, they're amazing. I love them. I want to know more about them. And then realizing how much trouble they were in, that was kind of what set me into what I was, I was doing. But I mean, I'm still amazed at frogs. I, I sit a lot of time on my computer and in meetings and, and those kind of things now as part of my job. But I've got to make sure that I still go out and I make recordings with Frog ID and I see frogs and I remember why I do what I do and I do it for these amazing creatures. So re really it was, it was just sort of love at first sight. It wasn't an academic reason. It was just, I just thought they were awesome. Great. Thanks so much. And thank you for the question. Did we have another hand up somewhere over here? Yes. Beautiful. So that question was, what made you want to become a scientist? And maybe this is something that we can throw to all of our scientists up here. Yeah, I guess we've all got a different story. I always, I always loved insects. I still have boxes of butterflies from New Guinea and things like that. And I just recalling about 1970, I found a monarch butterfly in my yard in North Ryde. It had a tag on it. And the tag said, call Australian Museum. And I did. And I got a letter back from whoever the scientist was studying those. So I feel I'm one of the early citizen scientists. And, and that really helped me get going. I eventually got into fish and frogs and all sorts of rats and things like that. But I always loved the natural world. So I guess it was natural to go to uni. I went to Sydney Uni and continue on that way. Yeah, I think very, very similar uh, to David. Uh, I spent my whole life growing up uh, exploring the bush, going beach combing, collecting insects, shells. So I was very lucky that I spent a lot of my childhood up uh, near Port Macquarie on the mid north coast of New South Wales. So I spent pretty much my whole life, every school holidays, going out and exploring nature. So that really drove my uh, curiosity and passion for the natural world. And I think in terms of actually becoming a scientist, I think coming to the realization that you can really make a difference uh, in the world uh, and that it's science, I think, is one of those really amazing areas where you can have a big influence on a lot of people and particularly really inspire the next generation of people like yourselves, all the new passionate scientists of the future coming up. And so I see that as a really important role that we all play. Um, and I really enjoy communicating, so I thought uh, matches up perfectly. So it's a really good opportunity yeah, to both make a difference in the world through more formal things like collecting data, but also uh, become a scientist so that I can inspire the next generation to become scientists as well. Cool. Yeah, I mean, for, for me, I, I was sort of accidental. I enrolled in environmental science. It was a toss-up between art and environmental science. I kind of like nature. I wanted to help. But honestly, it wasn't super passionate. I never did, like, stream watch or any of those kind of extracurricular science things at all. And then it was falling in love with frogs. And, and it was wanting to make a difference and realising you could through science. Um, and frogs just happened to be my obsession in that route. Yeah, that's really great. And I think it's so interesting how everyone's journey uh, varies so much and how you can find your specialty or uh, interest in the smallest of things. So I think that's really something we can all keep in mind and the different ways that we can make a difference even through citizen science at a young age. Beautiful. Great question. Any other questions from our audience? Yes. Uh, 
uh, you're asking if sea dragons are different from seahorses. They're in the same group. It's a really interesting group. There's, um, you've probably heard of seahorses. There's about 50 or 60 species around the world. Um, only two are endangered. One of them lives in Sydney. It's called the white seahorse. I don't know if you've seen. We've just recently bred them up in captivity and we're releasing baby ones, which we tag and follow to try and get the populations around Sydney and places going. There's also pipe fishes, which are like an unrolled seahorse and, and sea dragon. So they're a really fascinating group. They all, uh, the males look after the babies, which is something very interesting. Um, and yeah, right here where we are now is a real global hotspot for these animals. Great, thank you. Any other questions before we finish up? Okay, great. Uh, I think our scientists deserve another round of applause. Thank you very much. <laughs>